Hello again, everyone. I am excited to welcome our next guest, Yannick Nesky. Yannick has over 15 years of experience developing automated workflows, modeling standards, model conversions, and data waterfalls. In this session, he'll be sharing how real-time decisions can accelerate operations and work changes, and how offices can take on more work with less and utilize project data over and over again. Welcome, Yannick, to the Section Cut stage. Thank you very much, George, and hello to everybody. I hope we've all had a fun day so far. I know there's been a lot of different information coming our way. A lot of learning, a lot of new, uh, very interesting presentations. I saw a couple this morning that were fascinating. So I hope to continue that. Um, now, before I get fully into the presentation, I kind of want to preface this with, I don't want to be specific about data or technical backend information because that's going to make your eyes glaze over. This is more so about, I think, demonstrating the thinking behind data, and more importantly, the thinking behind the value of information, because that's really what our job is all about. So with that context, I'll go ahead and get started now and lead you through kind of the, uh, the process that I've gone through in my journey a little bit, but also how I think firms I've worked with in my consultation business, what we do. So first off, real-time data. What does that sound? What does that sound like, right? It sounds like computers and hardware and software. Really what it is, it's just distributed information, right? Uh, and another way of thinking about that is once you've got real-time information, you can start to make real-time decisions about cash flow. I mean, at the end of the day, this is an industry built on cash flow. We're a service-oriented industry, right? We only can make as much money as services we can deploy. So that's what this really is wrapped around. A little bit about myself very quickly. I've got 15 years of experience. Over 20 million square footage of work, worked on mixed use, healthcare, education, civics, sports, cultural work. And I live in this space between data, design technology, and operations. Um, I've got my own website, which you can reach out to me to talk about that later. But my name is Yannick, pronounced just like it says at the top left there, Yannick. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, information, like I've mentioned. So first and foremost, right, what is the fundamental problem, if there is a problem, in some people's eyes there might not be? With architecture, well, information breakdown. That's my thesis, and you can probably disagree with me, but I think that's the biggest problem, right? An information breakdown can be defined as any misunderstanding of a situation that leads to actions that are inappropriate and counterproductive to interests. Now, how many of you would think that sounds just like uh, a lot of the architectural process when things go wrong? Well, that's kind of what it is, right? So first, architecture is information. Design is decision-making, and we make decisions with information. All we deploy when we are architects to regulators, to our clients downstream is information, right? So how many of us have asked ourselves, um, if only I had the chance to do that over again, right? And how many have gone, whether you're nine or 90, I I'm making decisions off of past experiences and I could have done that better. That's what, that's what we're kind of getting at here, right? As a point of reference, sometimes we ask others about our, their experiences, especially if we don't have our own history to fall back on, right? So why do we do this? It's because we want to take advantage of the experience in order to make our lives better. This is the same thing that's happening right now in architecture is we've, we're losing knowledge base. Highly experienced architects are leaving the profession, either retiring or just moving on. And as a consequence, newer architects or people coming up in the industry aren't able to learn what they need to learn in order to do the work, right? So we've got lots of information happening on a people level. And the second part of this too is in the world of capital projects where the goal in most cases is to end up with something that gives your company a competitive edge, we're losing competitive edge by not taking advantage of existing knowledge in our models, in our information, in our documents, right? So there's twofold information loss happening. A lot of it, right? And again, architecture is information. So we're fighting a losing battle. Now to quickly review some of the uh, information centers that you might be losing information in, or maybe you're succeeding at. Don't wanna be all negative here. There's models, assemblies, design changes. I mean, you can go through this whole list, right? Code requirements, construction, punch list information, RFIs operate, all this stuff, right? All of it. Now, what does this lead to? This leads to um, information handover, right? And that information handover usually happens with documents. And documents are what we live and breathe, and we, everybody here loves them and hates them. But what that really means is data, right? So I want you to think about that. Keep this in the back of your mind, that what we're doing is we're taking 
information and moving it between places to succeed. That's what a business model right now. So if you have an understanding of projects by category, by typical workflow, by information centers where information is moving from one party to the next internally in your own teams, right? And you want to get better at it. How do you do it? Well, let's take a look at this. I mean, this is just a really simple drawing that's effectively uh, a bunch of models on a, on a typical kind of offices setup, right? But some of them have some similarities. These four here in particular, they're not just because of the way they're made, but they're similar in shape. They're similar probably in their scope. They're similar probably in so on, so on, right? Now, what we're getting into is basically statistics. And apologies for the fuzzy image, but I couldn't find a better one that communicated what I'm trying to get at here. This is us. This is where architects are at right now. And in comparison to most of the digital world that exists right now, what we're in a very preliminary stage. A lot of other industries have moved into taking advantage of their information in a way that, in, that gives them competitive edge. And if you're a small firm and you're trying to get ahead of your competitors, the way to do that is by taking advantage of projects that you've won and exceeded at and succeeded at and then turning that into really powerful uh, sh kind of a sharpening mechanism, right? Because you need to get ahead of your competitors. How do you do that? You learn from your projects and you learn from your successes. And then you can get into things like predictive analytics, perhaps, right? Maybe even having a database as a basis for that, which I would hope you do. And then getting into all these other things, business intelligence and predictive analytics and natural language processing. I'm not going to go into all that. It's not so relevant. But a quick kind of example of that is in, in our current firm, we're starting to get into things like predict, not predictive analytics, but just pure analytics, right? Business intelligence, which shows us information on people's modeling and the kind of information they're putting into their work. And then we can correlate that to the project category. We can go, this is on kind of on point. This is accurate for what we're expecting, or it's not. And we can figure out how to improve that. And then by extension, if you kind of pull back a little bit here, this is where we lie, right? We're trying to standardize. And what... I, I want the, the entire industry to move into is, you know, kind of quantifying that information and in turn automating some of it to make our process better. If you look in the big data kind of table, this is really quick. I don't want to talk about this too much. We're in the early stages. Just want to reiterate that, right? We're really early in figuring out how to take advantage of information. The next steps are to kind of take that and, and make richer information out of that baseline to get to this. Now, this seems really reductive, but this says, in volumes louder than I can ever explain what we're trying to get at. Architecture as a whole should be about design, right? Decision making, not the gathering of information, the bundling of information, moving it from party to party, asking your client, asking your, you know, this li the liability stakeholder that you need to talk to or your downstream kind of uh, super when you're on site. All of this should be information that deploys back and forth between parties. And it shouldn't be something you have to push and pull on. And as a consequence, way down the road, if we gather enough information, you can start to develop intelligence. I think that's what we do. That's what people do, right? We learn and our experiences inform our process. We become better at our job through experience. And now we can do that and apply it to our own projects, right, in a current kind of setup. So I want everybody here to kind of, if you have any questions about that first process of how I've gotten to where I'm at, what I'm, what I'm talking about, now's the time to kind of ask questions but I'd like to, to get questions kind of focused around where everybody feels like they lie on that kind of, uh, that thinking curve, right? How far along you are in terms of developing your information tracking, how far along you are in terms of keeping categories of information uh, discrete, if you're even thinking about data, if you're, if you're really not even touching this stuff, if you're approaching how to start to separate information. If you're at the level of, you've already got a database of typical projects, and when you start a project, you've got not only a template and content, which is kind of par for the course at this point, but preloaded category information, uh, preloaded information in terms of uh, fee expectations, right? Based off of the kind of work you're doing, you typically can start to kind of predict margins, right? So are, is anybody taking advantage of this thinking already? Is this something that's completely alien to most right now, or are we getting closer to that uh, right now? And I'll give everybody some, some, some time here to think about this.
So I see here from, it looks like from Nathan. In the chat, yeah. Okay. Well, let's just, yeah, let's, I guess let's talk about that first, right? Our, our data strategy is, is sophisticated as taking advantage of categorical project win information. It's taking advantage of fee uh, margin information per project category. And our information tracking internally has also been mostly built off of um, beyond project naming and numbering, which I think is a trap a lot of people fall into. So let's let's go to the next step here, and I think I can talk a little bit about kind of per, current project data because I, I think. Uh, oh, here we go. No, Jody has a question. Firm is three years old. Starting to try and figure out what to do with their data. See, that's that sounds fair because I think that's where if you're on the higher end of kind of data informed workflow, that's a good place to be, especially for a younger firm. Um, and you have agility at your side too to take advantage of that information and turn it into something else that gives you a kind of richer process. That's okay. That that informs me a little bit because I, I wanted to get a kind of a grasp on the audience to to see how they they're lying on this right now. Okay, we can go we can go to the next stage now. Thanks, George. So current project data, right? This is I'm going to breeze through kind of how work happens right now because again, this stuff is really big. You know, it can make you kind of bored to death if we go over it too much. But in brief, the current state is we've got piles of data models and paper, right? You've got Excel files, you've got PDFs, emails, you've got databases, which basically is Revit information. You've got Navis works coordination happening on the construction end. Um, you've got information as well that's CAD and two-dimensional and needs to be turned into uh, three-dimensional work for uh, you know an architect. And you've got to take that information and you've got to bring it together, right? Like I mentioned earlier, it also looks like this. If you're more on the engineering side, right? You've got a BIM model, you've got a cat, you've got a mechanical model, you've got takeoffs, so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. And the typical kind of workflow is basically you've got pre-designed planning that takes advantage of really, if we're being honest, kind of no information from previous wins or previous projects. But what it does take advantage of is experience. And I think that that's a big problem that, again, the firm is, the, uh, the industry as a whole is facing right now is that information's not leaving our most experienced leaders and, and going into the hands of new architects who need to learn, right? Um, so let's say that uh, first and foremost, right, workflow management is uh, not doing what we needed to do. And then document management is also not doing what we needed to do, right? Look at the the kind of the industry as a whole right now when it comes to uh, shared data. It's basically you've got a model, you take the model, you give it to the contractor downstream, and they work with it. Right? Again, models, assemblies, design changes, logistics, site analysis, all these things, and then you've got all these different systems. And this information is not moving between these different companies. Uh, I should say platforms, if you're internally in your company, and that you want them to start to flow between your different parts of your company seamlessly right? Which is live project data. So let me talk a little bit here about pushing it forward, right? Because what I want everybody to understand is that we, we're trying to get to a point where we're no longer worried about um, bringing obvious information to bear. It should be about making decisions, right? So if we go back to this slide here for a second, right now we're at the stage of collecting information is most of our job. And that shouldn't be the case. Right? Most of our job should be making decisions on information. So what does that look like, right? And, and some brief statistics here on kind of data um, and realities of data, right? And communication. We waste uh, almost half of our information and data not working with other platforms and our collaborators. A massive loss. We have to manually take stuff and move it downstream or upstream. And then again, it's just a massive time waste and you're losing money. On every project you do where you're not taking advantage of historical project information and pushing that into your new projects. So a little, little bit of like uh, context, non-architectural, really um, common things at this point in other professions, right? 
You've got PLM systems, which are basically product lifecycle management systems that take advantage of project information like what we've got now, and they're turning it into engineering uh, and constructible information. And as construction is happening, making changes on the fly because you, you need to make changes to the work you're doing if you're constructing, say, uh, a missile or a ship, right? It's an inordinate amount of wasted capital if you were to make a decision after something's been done incorrectly. So what they've got is kind of feedback systems that take advantage of current information and feed it back into the design process as it's happening. Now, this is kind of the typical forward state as I've imagined it. And I think this lines up with a lot of colleagues I've talked with, they're thinking too, that we've got requirement management, you've got systems engineering, development, design, the production, the planning, the construction itself, service, you know, operations, and then the building itself is finished at that point, right? Now, what we need to do is tie these things together and you do that with information. So this is the pushing part of it. We've talked a little bit about information coming into projects that you're doing from historical project wins, from historical project um, experience, right? The knowledge is being shared. And now we're talking about pushing that information forward to work with other collaborators and to push it forward to work with on-site construction so that what you're working on is not having to be redone after it's been done in error, but rather being caught. I mean, this happens right now with RFIs, but the latency is inordinate, right? We want to enable operations validation. We want to enable business case assessment when you start a project and have an accurate read on how much money you're going to make. We want to enable real-time assessment of change consequences, risk, right? It's our biggest ally and our biggest enemy is risk. It's how we make our money. It's also how we get caught. So you want to be able to track risk and what that, those things that affect risk as you're doing that process, right? In a dashboard, if you will. Now, I'm going to give you an example from a colleague firm, uh, Shop Architects. They, this, they did this project in Botswana. Um, and, I, and I quite like it because it, it lends a lot to what I'm getting at. Okay. This panelization system was for a project um, that they did on site. And it uses some prefabricated elements that are built on site as well. And what they're doing, uh, or what they did rather, is track kind of the installation and the process of that project on the fly, realizing the design changes against what's been constructed and using sensor information, which tells you process drift information. It, it tells you uh, kind of issues you're gonna have with fit, issues you're gonna have with uh, uh, you know, you know, wearability, if it's gonna be able to sit in a location for a certain amount of time. And then what they're also operating with is this really simple instruction kit that's almost like an IKEA um, process, right? And this is project data. This is another way of thinking about information is it doesn't have to be deployed for constructability purposes as it has to be deployed for a regulator to approve the process. So you can bring information to bear to a contractor differently than you would typically because that information communicates better and they're gonna understand what they need to do better. Now here's the kicker. This whole process was done with on-site untrained labor, right? So you've got information that's legible enough that an untrained uh, uh, team of, of workers can develop and build and construct and assemble panels that typically would be very much requirement of uh, expertise, right? So if you're looking at kind of the, the breadcrumbs of where I'm leading you with here, you've got all these different points of information connection that can either inform a project or detract from a project, but they need to be connected. And then you look a little bit more at kind of the, the corollary or other systems that exist right now. And I'll talk about this because it's, it's very relevant that Adobe has this system called um, DLS, which is a design language system, right? Now, what this makes reference to is depending on where you are, uh, on stream, you know, on the stream of interface. If you're looking at a computer, if you're looking at your phone, if you're looking at a website, doesn't matter. That what you're able to see is the same information regardless of how you look at the information. So not only are we taking advantage of projects, historical project information, not only are you pushing uh, information that is being changed or informed, you're, not, you're deploying it in many different ways to different audiences depending on what they need to see, right? So come full, full circle here for a second and to kind of ask, uh, to kind of go back out a little bit, I'd like to ask questions now. Um, 
are you guys kind of understanding of where I'm getting at here? Because the, the point is that we, we want to get information moving from party to party. We want to get information moving from process to process, but we also want to deploy it to the right, to the right people in the right way and get them to understand um, the information without having to do translation or legibility. Uh, and I think George here makes a very good point that if you're working at a smaller scale and you're working on residential projects, you're not going to be able to deploy a ton of information. But um, the information that you can deploy, even on a small scale with residential projects, does end up informing your wins because you've got a very, say, configurable kind of approach, right? If you work on small scale residential projects, you know the kind of typical wall assembly. You're probably going to be localized. You're probably going to have an understanding of contractors you typically work with. You're probably going to have an understanding of supply information. You're probably going to have a lot of uh, data that might not be so grand in its scale, but very specific. And that still would give you a richness and save you time and a lot of money in how you work on a project, right? So say you start a project for a, a smaller scale, uh, just an R1 home, you're still going to be able to load win information into that by taking advantage of I've learned from this kind of roofing creates this kind of issue. Working with this kind of contractor, typically they're a little slower, they cost a little bit more, but they're always accurate. This kind of client requires this kind of information. So there's lots of different ways to kind of push and pull uh, on the data. I hate, I just hate using the word data. That's why I'm saying information so much. But there's a lot of ways to push and pull on that knowledge to inform your process, to push you faster and further. I think that gives you an edge at the end of the day. Just to riff on that a little bit, I think um, there's something about that shop example, which I found fascinating, which is it's not just even the, like in, in the chat, I was talking about like the scope of work being one sort of one variable, which inherently it's kind of also about complexity. Like, right, it's like a shop made a decision to design that building in a specific way, right? Um, that probably uh, is novel. And so that novelty then requires a like if you want to design for novelty or design an organization that that uh, is all about novelty in some sense, then you have to think about how data can be a much more real time in some sense than if you were to standardize things because you're not having to deal with necessarily the com uh, complexity on site or you know you're trying to reduce as much risk as possible because you kind of started with a very risky proposition from the beginning versus like maybe uh, residential, you know, if, if you kind of know what your bread and butter is from a residential perspective, where you alloc where, where the data could have the most leverage might be different or might be elsewhere in that yeah. kind of diagram you showed. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I do kind of want to talk my way back to that too, at the very end here, I'll, I think I'll just do mostly talking actually, because I think that's what I, I think I'm going to get the most, um, understanding through that, that the scale of your work, the complexity of your work, it doesn't make the data informed process irrelevant. I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna have an application for everybody. Um, and we're not just talking BIM models here. I, I wanna make that really clear because uh, you know Revit, great. It does a lot of things fantastic, but it's terrible in many ways. Uh, and really what I'm getting at more so is um, tracking your own work and sharing that work with others in the firm to help them become smarter and better at doing their job. And that's monograph is a fantastic example of resource tracking is one of the most fundamentally flawed, I think right now process in architecture firms, the most part, but a great way to improve it is to start to learn through research resource tracking and management and how to take that and apply it against your analytics that are non resource driven, right? So things like model information, things like delivery dates, that are kind of corollary and connected in some way. And then you can get derivative information. This is, I know I'm, I'm using words that make it sound more complicated than it is. I'm trying to think of a simpler way of saying this, but when you've got resource management and you've got historical kind of project database, and then on top of that, you've got a system for developing novel information deployment, you can really change the way a firm works altogether. You're no longer fixated on this, uh, you know, very classic design down to development, down to CD. You can operate in many parallel streams and you can either hyper-specialize or go broad and generic. 
you can mess with the, the orientation of your entire organization hierarchy. You don't have to be as vertical. And there's a great example earlier, someone talking about how they are, they offer kind of three tiers of kind of uh, salary for their employees and they've got a very horizontal structure and it's an entirely woman owned organization. It's a great presentation, but connect that with, you're tracking all of your project successes and wins in terms of kind of constructible information that succeeded, you know, RFI, low project success, uh, resource unintensive, you can start to compare those things. So you can say, we had a low RFI project that won with a very large margin against our typical, which again, you wouldn't know without project tracking, right? That's really fundamental, basic stuff. And then you attach that further to the construction process after you've quote unquote finished your, your process as an architect, that starts to turn into something else. Then you've got a, then you've got a whole other edge. And that's, that's a broad systematic difference from most firms you work with right nowadays are not like that at all. Yeah. We think there's even like low hanging fruit too, on that note, like uh, even the idea of uh, templates, which we've, we rolled out um, in the past six months, how you can, I mean, it's like both a people and a process thing. Like one thing is a tool can only do so much. You also have to have a cultural ambition to be looking at this data rigorously, yes. or at least like have a, it's not even about rigorous. It's just, the rigor is in the, in the, in the cadence of it, right? So after you do a pro, after you deliver a project, plan a retrospective after that project has been delivered, where everyone can bring up both qualitative and quantitative information about this, the successes and failures of that project. And then it's like, then you revisit the next proposal and you say, what, what failed out of that last project? Where were the bottlenecks there so that we can charge more potentially, or at least exactly. redesign the process, right? It's just, it's exactly. Yeah. It's, it's just informing your, and I'll answer two questions here. I saw from Sims and Matt, uh, get to that just a second here, close out that thought George had w w once you're able to kind of associate not just money and time, but money and time and quality, you, the level of decision-making skyrockets. So that's where we're getting, that's what I think George is kind of getting at. And I'm trying to deliver that thought too. So first off Sims, um, how do you start storing that data and making that data accessible? Uh, you, you need to strategize in a very macro way. Don't even think about numbers or data formats. Just think about what you want to track that's going to give you something in return. The first step is to figure out what you want. I mean, like anything, pull planning is always the way. <laughs> Start with what you want and work backwards to how to get there. And I, now, if I mean, you, you know, later I'll put my stuff up and Monograph, I'm sure, has many resources for this as well. But, you know, feel free to reach out and I can help you figure out how to figure out, start tracking data and database management as a whole. Um, really, it depends on what you're looking for. You don't want to, I've seen it happen time and time again, and I want to, I want to, play devil's advocate for a second here. Sometimes firms will go full Monty. They'll have ma massive database management, full analytics. They'll have a just a, an unbelievable amount of resources committed very quickly to kind of data management, which is not always what you need to do. Really what it begins with is making a very careful, you know, scalpel sharp decision about what exactly you want to start with and then build on that. Now, the caveat there is the way you build the first step is fundamental to how everything else is going to succeed. So again, I'd recommend talking with you know talking with talking with professionals, looking at resources. You know, feel free to reach out to me again. There's there's many ways to do it. Um, and I, I think the follow up on that too is Matt asked the same question: How does a firm begin to organize their data? That's the great first question that most ask, right? Because we have projects that include anything from assembly information to spec information to a number of RFIs to how long it took on site versus expected estimates, takeoffs, I mean, actual design, documentation, models, all this stuff, right? And you have to take, a, again, a first step back and kind of parse through that and go, what do we want to focus on that's going to give us juice? Because that's really what it's about, right? You're, you're trying to get lemonade. And the only way to really do that is to pick at the couple of categories of information that are actually going to feed back into success later, which means you have to usually sit down with, in, in many ways, in, in kind of a, a big, a big meeting and just talk it out and pull plan. My in my success stories I've had with um, firms I've consulted with or my work at HMC is usually we talk with teams and have kind of a feedback session where we ask them to be very honest with us. And it, it, you know sometimes you have to deal with a little too much honesty, but that's 
that's what you want. You want to get that kind of feedback and collect information on what people are looking for. And then you and your ownership kind of strata can make a decision on how to play that. So it, again, resources out there for kind of figuring out what to ask yourself first. There are plenty of professionals that can, you can consult with. Um, the first place to start is figuring out what you want to change. Um, because right now, data is such a big, broad subject in this chat. It's kind of hard to give you really applicable <laughs> feedback. You'd have to, you know, sit down and think about it first, and then strategize. I hate to not give you more specifics, but yeah, I, th I think most people probably intuit what are those challenges that they keep running up against in delivering projects, and that's probably that might be a good place. As a the north star of the business probably starts first. So like, what do you want to do next year or this year, right? Do you want is it that you're looking to uh, grow as a business? Is that the kind of uh, driving force, or you want to get more efficient on what you're act actively doing now? So just kind of starting with that question, and then it's looking at what are the like maybe lagging or leading indicators of something like that, right? Like what what are the things that are um, maybe very uh, downstream in terms of that process, where it's whether it's like, you know, CDs end up being a big, a big problem within the firm for whatever reason, it's likely something that's happening in schematic that should be addressed on, should be addressed in thinking through the design of project delivery. Um, and so it, it, that could be a good grounding place to just start with is like, wh what do we want to do as a company and then work backwards from what are the problems that we intuit we're facing today that are blocking us from getting there and yeah. then start to kind of work your way down into what are the ways in which we can measure that impact problem. Yeah. And I, I think I'll add to that and to, to kind of reiterate another angle of answer, perhaps to Sims and Matt's question there, there are beyond just database management, connecting different streams of information in a really simple way. If you've, you know, the data you're getting from your first organization pass is the process of adding keynotes to our projects is terrible. Something as simple as that. Fine. And then you'd know right there, well, maybe we should figure out how to do that better. Where are we spending the most? Is it because we're doing it later in a project? Is it because we're adding them too early and we end up having to change the keynote, you know, if we're thinking kind of Revit? Um, or if you're working in 2D space, do these things even matter? There's a lot of questions about really simple tasks as well. So another great example, um, if we're talking kind of sheets or creating documents for projects, why are we always having to redo a title block on every project? Well, it turns out because most project managers and most project architects have their own desires. They want to have options, right? And this plays into my big thought process on the industry as a whole and, and on even just software usage is that people want options. We don't really want to be told exactly what to do. And I, we've all experienced it. It doesn't work. You can't tell people exactly how to work because that's just not, we're human. We all have our own desires and methods. So the creating optionality is another, I guess, another answer to your question is if you're realizing that bottlenecks happen in your workflows, because there's a very specific small funnel for how work is being done. And what turns out needs to be done is you need to create a wider funnel by giving people more options on how to do the work. That's data connectivity, because then now you're creating more points of success for inputs and outputs on a project typical workflow. So I, I guess I'll reiterate again, the first step any firm should take, and this is me because I'm biased for growth and accelerating your, your, your process, find your, find your golf ball through a hose moments. There's no other way to think about it. You got to figure out where your process is getting bottlenecked. And if you're figuring that first step out, then you know what, where you can start to fix it. And then you can work backwards to figure out what kind of information needs to be collected. And, um, you know, the first part of the presentation I was talking about historical project information, and that does lead to a lot of success uh, on larger scale firms and firms that have a lot of history. But if you're a newer firm, it actually presents you with a, a massive opportunity. There's a massive opportunity there because you have the ability to set your firm up right from the get-go. And this gives you a big leg up on a lot of medium to enterprise size firms that they're not going to be able to compete with is agility. So you're asking questions about how to start doing it by asking questions on how to start doing it. You're already in many ways ahead of the competition. 
And then working with an, a resource tracking platform like Monograph is a fantastic example. And I'll list other uh, kind of database management tools that I use personally and love. Things like Notion and Airtable are fantastic. In combination with things like Monograph, you can start to connect. You've got research tracking happening. You've got data moving between platforms that you can use in other ways. And then you can start to automate uh, communications like RFIs and emails between collaborators without having to really sit there and, again, collect the information. That's the, the opposite of what we want to do, right? We want to make decisions. So um, I'm sure you'll have more questions as, as we kind of head out of time. We have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to just keep keep riffing on the original, uh, the last slide I had here, actually, to, to, or another slide. Let me go back. Let's see here. Here it is. Okay, so in essence, I'm going to go to talking about information deployment, right? Because I kind of went over this very quickly, and I think I want to reiterate the power of it. When you're in a smaller firm and you've got the ability to figure out how to deploy information, you're you're focused on deadlines and making sure that information is presented to authorities having jurisdiction on time to get them built on time. And I understand that's the first thing you're going to be dealing with every project. But the secondary ask that I kind of propose firms start to think about in the future, how can you change the way you deploy information to your collaborators that gives them a leg up? I mean, we all know this and we kind of are intuitively connected with it, but if you provide an easier workflow and you're a, you're a quote unquote smarter partner with all your downstream and upstream, you know, your clients, then they're going to want to work with you, right? And you develop a, a more of an ingrained partnership. So I, I kind of want to get at some of the prerequisite, excuse me, for de developing long-term success. Let's say after you've reached a certain point of kind of uh, data intelligence, you want to be working with the right collaborators, right? You need to find the right collaborators. That's a that's a given, and you want to be able to work with them in ways that give them the information they need and kind of nothing else. Because I think many times what we see with, with deploying information and data to other kind of collaborators, sometimes we present too much information. I think there's a lot of fear of, of not putting enough down uh, in some cases for construction. And I think in other cases too, we want to give clients, I think more of a precise delivery of information. So when they're looking for you know, facilities management kind of connected results. Something like, a, you know, Kobe. I don't know how many of you are aware of what Kobe is, but it's basically like facilities data. Terrible slog to go through and enable it. And that's another example of how you can, de you can deploy that information to clients in much smarter ways uh, by not going through the typical workflow that they ask for. So sometimes the presenting that information isn't so much about real data, but rather just having that connectivity in your firm to say, we've done this before, We've got reference in our in our firm standards and guides kind of practices uh, column that people can refer to and know if you're doing this kind of thing in a project, don't do it the way the client asks, do it this way. And it's going to give them a richer reward and it's going to, we're going to be better for it and it's going to pay off. So a lot of the time too, information delivery, right? Data is not so much about real numbers, zeros and ones, it's about learned uh, experience and knowledge, which I talked about a little bit earlier, right? That we've got a great issue uh, in architecture that our people are leaving the, the industry and in that process, we're not keeping or retaining the kind of the intelligence that we need to, to keep. So um, on that note, I, I've actually gone through most of my presentation. I'm gonna leave you guys with uh, this image just to think about one more time, right? If you've got a project under construction and you've got construction happening, how to coordinate that, just connect that with this a little bit. And I know that's really esoteric, but the connection is, is actually really what I think the industry as a whole is moving towards. Being predictive, not just seeing issues as they're happening, but seeing issues just before they're happening and being able to check that information on the fly. Um, all right, so before we get into full-on Q&A, uh, again, reach out to me. You know, I've got my own website, yonic.digital. Um, you can scan the QR code. You can also find me on LinkedIn, of course. And beyond that, I'm very happy to do a quick Q&A. Uh, I think we only have a, 
think eight or so minutes left for that process. But thank you so much for listening. Any questions? That was great, Yannick. I do have one comment. Uh, we could probably turn it into a question here uh, from Steven. Um, I have 25 years of project drawing data. Looking back at that data is difficult because you have to spend the time to categorize that data, right? Building science and products and codes change over time. And so making some of that data, you know, all, or that data can become obsolete or the format of that data can become obsolete. Um, you know, obviously the, in the industry itself, there's just so many different standards. Um, in, in these different platforms that we're talking about, bring different standards um, like Airtable, right? Or Notion, the way that information is structured there is not necessarily easiest to maybe bring into other platforms necessarily. So what are your thoughts about that itself? Just like this, this standardization of this information um, in the industry. Okay, so I've, I've got a very strong hunch that the, the profession is gonna be dealing with this right now for the next decade. It's like the, the big issue is that we've got all this um, platform proprietary information. I'm gonna, big one in the room is Revit, but there's other things like CAD drawings. There's other things like PDFs from old project wins, like Steven here is saying that might have outdated code requirements or they might be, uh, you know, old products don't exist anymore. And that kind of streamlining um, or is actually very close to what I kind of specialize in, which is data waterfalls. And that requires, and there's no other way to get past it. This is the hard truth. Somebody has to connect that information to new information. That's, that's a full on job, right? And that's, there are many companies that Autodesk in particular is putting a lot of effort into it. Uh, but to get kind of broad again and back out a little bit, um, if you have 25 years of document, the great news is there are there are a few startups right now that are beginning the process of turning 2D information into scannable database information, which sounds like Star Trek, but it's it's actually pretty pretty much a direct one to one of what they're trying to do. So if you've got PDF information from a project uh, or a product, and you have an idea that there's this product, this old product, is in this old drawing, what you can do is connect a new product to this old product and say, anytime you scan a, a drawing, I hope you get, you're following me here. You scan this drawing and you've, you've told the system, this old product is now this new one. As it scans in, you've got a new product in place of the old one, because you know that product doesn't exist anymore. I mean, let's say also code change is happening. That, that's a really hard one because there's no answer to that. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is code changes happen and make things obsolete all the time. Uh, even on projects in the middle of design. So there's there's always cases of having to adjust on the fly. And I think what what matters there is making the discernment between what information that you can glean something from is worth the time and what information is not worth the time. Because you know that it's going to have so many adverse checks you're going to have to go through to see that it's relevant. It becomes much more about, you know, a few steps back, kind of the macro information of the project. It took us... 15 years start to finish to get this mass, massive hospital project finished. You know, where can we make that 12 years? And it can be from something as simple as saying, we're just not gonna use these products. Or something as specific and honed as when we were doing all the modeling, we weren't paying attention to all of the thicknesses of our wall assemblies on shear wall conditions. So, you know, I'm giving broad examples here, but it, it requires asking, you know, yourself again, your first, the first principles question, what is what is the value of what we're trying to get at? And then you can kind of parse through your, your project information and go, this is not going to be worth it ever. This might be worth it. These will be worth it. And you can start to inform yourself. But it, it, again, it's a very complex process, but especially you put out two doozies right off the bat, product replacement, which happens all the time in healthcare on our side too, in education um, at HMC, we deal with that frequently, right? Equipment replacements. Uh, outdated equipment, equipment updates. That's a lot of our, a lot of our work. So it's very relevant. And then of course, uh, code is. Yeah, I wish I had the answer for you there. Code is always going to be code. I think there's a, there's another um, idea that's come up not just in this conversation but also elsewhere about reaching out. You know, there's one thing about you as a firm owner or a person working within a firm where you're always, you're kind of taking on a new project and then basically learning through 
trial and error of that project. There are also a lot of consultants out there that get to see things multiple times, right? Because they get to work on different types of projects, maybe more, um, you know, at different time horizons, but they get to, they get to be more, uh, have more at-bats, basically. They are really great to rely on to bring in so that you can learn from their failure, potentially, right? It's much cheaper to learn through other people's failures than your own. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things where thinking about the tool set, it's not just the tool set that one can bring to a product is not just tools like Monograph or, you know, Revit or whatever, right? It's also the people that you can bring on as a resource that can help you see through the fog and help you learn faster. And I think, you know, from a product perspective, Monograph, what, what I love about this conversation is that this is pretty much in line with how we also think about the kind of value that we want to provide the majority of the industry, right? So why is our focus on small firms? Because they need, and medium sizes, because they need the most help. Oftentimes, larger firms have more resources to collate this information, do things with it. Our whole ambition is to make it so at scale, already kind of uh, harness all the information that we're gathering to provide those kind of insights agnostic of, you know, you know, uh, the firm essentially, right? Yeah. So we can, we can add value because of that network effect. Yeah, scalability. That's it. And it's an essential building block when you're in a small place as a firm, you're just beginning. I mean, George, George is getting at is kind of in line with what I was saying a little bit earlier that you, if you have the foresight and the ability to strategize your firm's structure, system process, right? I hate that word system makes me cringe, but it's a, it's a little bit kind of what it is. If you have the ability to set that up correctly from the get-go, you can operate at one and a half, two times the speed of a firm that is much larger in scale, not only because they're massive and, you know, big shift turns slow, but because you've got that much more foresight in how your systems work. I mean, you'd really be surprised at the very basic kind of level of workflow improvement that a lot of firms seek to do and they can't because of their scale. So the agility you have, and especially like Monograph, like, like George is saying here, it's a fantastic tool. It's scalable, right? So scalability is a huge part of building out the right uh, management systems. And I, again, I hate using that word systems, but it's, it's kind of what it is. It's unavoidable. We talked about the whole Earth Project catalog in another conversation uh, today, or that was in the chat. So like bringing up these sort of older terms of like systems and, yeah. and it's like it's still applicable. But um, we're at time now. So... I just want to thank you so much, Yannick, for that uh, awesome conversation around yeah, thank data you. and interoperability. Um, it's really fascinating. I think it gave a lot of people in the audience a lot to think about. Well, it was fantastic. I mean, I'm really happy that, that I got to reach small business owners in particular, I think, are where the juice of the industry is going to lie for a long time. And we're going to make big progress with small firms. Absolutely. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.